Hi guys, welcome back. Jonathan here with a table full of stuff. I like to think you've recognised right away what this is, even though it has a pretty serious apparent omission, notably the trigger. Apparently, th there is apparently no trigger on this on this rifle, except there is, which I'm coming to in a moment. What is the rifle? Well, as I say, I hope you've figured out that this is in fact a Martini series rifle, and it is the Martini Henry, which is the original 45 caliber, but a very long bullet. Goes all the way down to about there. So small bore for the 18, uh, early 1870s when it came in, um, but <laughs> very long and so still really heavy, uh, with the potential for it tumbling when it, when it hits you and at the very least doing some pretty serious injury. And it's a huge cartridge, of course, uh, bottlenecked, made out of brass foil famously, um, which wasn't ideal and did cause some problems, but maybe not to the extent that a lot of people make out. Um, incidentally, on the Martini generally, definitely check out Neil Aspinshaw's book on the Martini Henry and British muzzle loaders, uh, Rob over there, uh, both friends of, of the armories, and they do a great job detailing. Um, uh, uh, and, how could I forget, C and Arsenal have also recently done a, a really good long deep dive on the Martini generally. Check those guys out for that. We have done our usual and found you something a bit weird. So this was, let's, let's talk about what, what sort of the life history of this rifle. So this kind of follows, well, kind of follows the story of a, of a lot of service rifles. So it was made in 1873 at Enfield has an 1873 date on its action body, is what we would tend to call this, or receiver, if you prefer. So made in 1873. Um, not, not that unusual at all, really. As a Mark I, so you can sort of figure this out from, if you're looking at Martinis or any, any British arm, really. What they've done is very neatly stamp a second one, Roman numeral one, next to the one to turn it into a Mark II. Um, so we, won't, we haven't got time to go into the deep dive of um, different marks of ordinary martini. As I say, I've got some good references that I've just given you on the main story of the Martini Henry. Um, it has an inspector's mark below that. We don't have a record of who the different Enfield inspectors were, sadly. So although we know that number relates to a specific inspector, um, unlike the Belgian proof inspectors, where we do know their name, we can't look up who that guy was and do some genealogy on him. That would be lovely. Can't do that. And of course, at the top, we have the Royal Crown, the, the, the cipher BR, uh, Victoria Regina. Um, this is the definitive Victorian rifle, even though the Lee Metford and Lee Enfield come in pretty quickly and, re and uh, not replace it. Um, this thing has a longer life than, than some people think. So that, that's as far as this went as an ordinary martini. And just to remind you what that should look like, it's the same thing, only it has a trigger and a trigger guard. So the all-important lever for the action, which you'll see operating in a minute. Um, obviously, that's on both rifles. But what's been done here is to delete the trigger, the ordinary trigger, for your, obviously for your index finger, and the guard that we need to protect ourselves from accidental discharges or negligent discharges. They're gone. And what they've done is adapt this, which is a thumb rest for your shooting thumb. As I know from slightly uncomfortable personal experience, first time I fired a martini, I did what you normally do with a rifle, and I wrapped my thumb over the wrist. Which means when this thing recoils, and it's a sort of a push, um, it's, not, it's not a real hard kick, but it's substantial, you end up squishing your own nose with your own knuckle. And that's because this is there for a purpose. This is a, a dished out and uh, checkered little thumb pad for you to rest your thumb to the side. And I, I think people at the time were a little bit wary of that. That doesn't feel very uh, stable and doesn't help you control the recoil maybe quite as well, but it's essential with this humped receiver, which is the only way you're gonna get that super efficient breech loading mechanism that defines this system. So that's an ordinary Mark, uh, Mark I rifle. This one was actually made the year after this guy who's the, the star of this particular episode, 
1874. Very similar markings otherwise. Um, they also have the, the little cartouche on the butt stock as well. So setting that one aside for the moment, back to this. So if we're deleting the, the finger trigger, as it were, how the heck are we firing this thing? Well, in 1884, and we have very little information on this, hopefully more to be found, but um, we haven't been able to, to find it as yet, and neither could the pattern room who had this rifle before. They moved the trigger to that thumb rest. So the thumb rest is still there, but over the top of it is now a little paddle. And it has a, instead of a, a trigger guard, a finger trigger guard, a bow, it has this flange, which means it's harder to accidentally depress the trigger by coming over the top. And as you shouldn't be grasping it like this anyway, necessarily, um, it's not less of a problem from this side, and in any case, you need to be able to access it. So there's, weirdly, there's a finger stop added to the lever. So it feels like there's a trigger with no trigger guard, almost like an old um, Scottish flintlock pistol or something. But that's, that's not a trigger. That's literally a place for your, for your um, itchy trigger finger to sit while you learn to fire with your thumb. Pretty weird. I can show you a little bit of how it works on this one. But amazingly, there's also a, a cutaway version I can show you too. So the lever comes down. Breech block drops, just, just like the ordinary martini. That's cocking the striker inside. We close, the, uh, we close the lever, and the thumb trigger is set. Now, because we don't like to dry fire these things without something to support them, um, I will open the lever and just press the thumb trigger, and you'll see the lever move very slightly. That's it decocking. It doesn't spring shut like the finger trigger. And I think that's to do with where the trigger interfaces with the internal mechanism. The cutaway is actually a different design. So this is part of the mystery here. We know that 40 rifles were made um, in 1884 for some sort of trial to maybe replace the finger trigger with a thumb trigger. So we know it's a uh, Watkins patent thumb trigger, um, which in theory would be applicable to other designs, but I gather that the patent um, which I will see if I can find um, uh, to show you, is designed around the martini because of, of how it works. But in theory, that it could probably be adapted to, to similar, um, similar dropping blo uh, tilting block um, designs. So you'll see there's no trigger guard on this variant, and the thumb trigger is a different profile. Um, I assume this is still Watkins patent. What it has instead is a, is a thumb safety. So lever goes down, and you can see roughly how this is working. And we'll bring the camera in and show you the detail of how it's working for those of you that are interested in that. So fully cocked. In fact, let's do that with an empty case, just to try and support the firing pin a little bit. There's a, a little block in the back there to do that. So we shove that in, close it up. Breech block rises, closes the breech. Make sure that's clipped in to make sure the system is fully locked. And in there, best place to see it, so right in there, we now have the, the sear, the, the, the tumbler arrangement in here. There's a little notch. And just like the top of a finger trigger holds back a piece of metal under spring tension, and then when you pull it, drops out the way and the striker flies forward. Exactly the same here, only it's keyed in at the back. Um, show you quickly on the on this conventional one this is a 402 caliber one but it's the same system uh, so this is much much easier to see we have this tumbler here so shaped like an L and as you bring this down the top of the, the nose of the trigger is setting into a, a little ledge on that thing so it's held back and then when you pull the trigger it moves that bit of metal out of the way, and this striker is free to, to fly forward. So the main, the main difference here is there's that bit of metal holding back the other bit of metal. It's at the front on this one, that L-shaped piece that, that rocks back and forth in the mechanism. You don't have to worry about the detail of that, but it's engaging at the front because the trigger is here. The trigger is literally in front of it. Because the thumb trigger is behind it, 
the same thing is the same engagement between those two metal surfaces is happening back here. That's as much as you need to know about that. The actual mechanism is unchanged, works the same way. So if you're now puzzling about how the safety works, well, with this now cocked and loaded, this, this thumb trigger version, obviously, you'll see there's checkering on here. There's not, no checkering on the trigger, interestingly, but you have to use part of your thumb to pull that back as you, and this, is, this will be it firing, obviously, as you press the trigger. It's a little bit fiddly. Um, the physical trigger guard on the rifle, which I have to assume is one of the four, the 40 rifles made for this um, troop trial, I assume it was. This is a bit more experimental, I think. This is like a layer of experimentation on top of the experimentation that they're already doing here. So I'll just do that again so you can hopefully see. Well, first of all, that's the ejection. I'll just pop it back in and see if you can spot the engagement actually happening. So right in here, that's where the two bits of metal are sort of mating together to hold back that striker. So the striker's in, in this inside the breech block, spiral spring around it, holding it back, and our two bits of metal holding each other back. And <laughs> Safety, de safety off, and fire. And it's just slipping off that sear, off that bent on the sear, just like normal. It's just happening at the back of the action, not up here. And that's purely because we've moved our trigger from here to back here. It doesn't really matter whether it's up here or down there. As to the trigger feel, um, well, it's a bit weird. Because you're not used to pressing a, this is, this is like, trying to press the brake pedal with your left foot in a car. You don't have that sort of muscle memory and trigger feel. So I couldn't tell you if this is a better or a worse trigger. It would just be very different. And you'd have to learn how to press the trigger with your thumb. Why would they do this? Well, thumb triggers were being tinkered with for sporting, for target purposes. Some, some seem to think that that was a superior way. Most didn't. And that's why we still have the, the finger trigger today. Now, this is our interesting side take on um, something that the real-time history guys are covering, the Anglo-Zulu War. So this is, this is 1884, this is after the, the, the conflict has, has happened, they're looking at refining. Um, well not the end of conflict in South Africa, of course, but they're looking at refining the design, and this is a, a road not travelled, essentially, which is something we specialise in on this channel, or on this series, rather. Um, the Martini, of course, is, is famous for its role in the Anglo-Zulu War, and the, the guys at Real Time History will be, will be giving you the military history there. Um, that being the case, we didn't want to only show you the weird and wacky Martini. We did want to cover for, for viewers of that, of that um, particular um, very good series, the ordinary Martini a little bit as well. So, as I say, this one made in 1874. The Martini is adopted in 1871, however, 1874 is more like the right date for when soldiers are actually going to get these in their, in their hands. Uh, we always think of date of adoption being, oh, overnight, they suddenly all have the latest rifle. Um, well, well, perhaps some of us do. Of course not. It takes years to actually produce enough to issue, get everyone trained up, and it's usually the, the, the prestige regiments, Royal Marines, the Guards, who were the first to get the new rifle, and um, the colonial forces, um, say Canada, for example, tend to be the last. So in this case, uh, the Snyder was in use uh, way longer than, than, than people think. Um, and actually, Canada's probably a wrong example because there's more overlap there. But certainly in the, in the British side of things, the Martini sees use into the 1890s. So you still see photo, I've seen a photo, early 1890s, certainly. Uh, Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders, they still, they're a frontline unit and they are still using Martinis in 1892, four years after the Lee Metford is introduced because of course it hasn't yet reached even the frontline units. So your reserve units, your, your colonial forces, they're gonna have Martinis for up until the First World War in some cases. Uh, India relies upon the Martini for longer. Now, we have to be careful. The switchover 
from the Martini Henry is, is relatively swift. But what they do instead is issue out 303 caliber Martinis, the Martini Metford, the Martini Enfield, as stop gaps, essentially. So yes, this thing carries on into the, the early 1890s. And then beyond that, it's going to be 303. The very last gasp of the Martini Henry, the, the big 450 caliber, um, was actually was in the First World War, but it was in the air. So um, briefly covered in an article I wrote about air crew weapons in the First World War. This was a pr this was well carbines. They used carbines because they were more handy in the air. Um, and ex a special explosive bullet, and this was to engage zeppelins and balloons, that that kind of thing. So the 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 Martini Henry saw very limited British use in the First World War. Um, the Martini Enfield, the Volunteer Training Corps variant, and again a carbine, but in 303, that was used in training in the First World War. Uh, we have one on display here for that for that reason. We always think of the Martini series as a, as a British rifle, and it, it well partly because it was extensively used by the British Empire, but also because the British Empire was so prominent on on the world stage and in military history. But of course, it's used by other nations as well. And I, I gather the, the Romanians made some use of the Martini Henry, the, the proper, as it were, Martini Henry in 450 or equivalent millimeter <laughs> caliber um, in the First World War. But the most of the Martini type rifles used in the First World War would have been converted, um, in our case, to, three, to 303. And the British did not use 303 infantry rifles of Martini action in the First World War, so far as I know, only in the air and in a very limited uh, capacity because it wasn't found to be tremendously effective for that um, Zeppelin busting role. But it was, a, it was a winning design, really perhaps the best of the single shot breech loaders. Um, Friedrich von Martini, Swiss designer. Um, the, the British were definitely not afraid to, to co-opt um, <laughs> foreign ideas for weapons. Um, some of the best British firearms are uh, invented by uh, people from, from overseas, or at least in part. Um, and the Henry, Alexander Henry, the, the Scotsman who invented the pattern of, of rifling, um, a, a semi-polygonal form of rifling that was found to be the best fit for that type of large, I was going to say slow projectile, but it's, it's like 1,300 feet per second or something, which is, this is essentially big bore handgun ballistics out of a full-size 10-pound rifle. <laughs> um, for the time, exactly what you wanted. And in fact, even after the magazine Lee Metford comes in um, and these things are being phased out of frontline British service, the Martini in 4.5 is being sold to the Boers in South Africa. So the British are arming their future enemy for a, a later, not that much later, conflict where these things are. They're not the Mauser rifle with the magazine system and the precision and the flat shooting uh, small bore projectiles, but they're big and they hit hard. Um, so the British soldiers are going up against their former friend, as it were, in this rifle. The same, of course, is true in um, the Anglo-Zulu War, where captured martinis are used against British troops. And of course, we can't talk about the, the Anglo-Zulu War without referencing the famous and amazing 1964 film Zulu which features a lot of these. Um, I don't know if they were Mark 1s, but certainly be Mark 2s. The Mark 2 would have been the prevalent um, variant. This is a bit early, perhaps, in that conflict. The trouble is, it was the early 60s, um, far from armourers like Bapti and co, so there were limited weapons and potentially limited blank ammunition in, in 4-5 Martini. And so one of the most notable goofs in the film is there are lots of charger loading Lee Enfields. They're not even the magazine Lee Enfield. They have the charger bridge over the action body. Um, they stick out like a sore thumb if you know firearms, especially if you're watching like a modern HD version on a big 60 inch TV. You're gonna go, those are the wrong rifles. They try to disguise them by removing the box magazine from in front of the trigger and by shimming on Martini Henry bayonets, uh, which we haven't got to show you today, but um, so at a glance, they look plausible enough, but then you see the guys having to operate it as a bolt action and that kind of gives it away. If you watch really closely, you might even spot a Swinburne Henry, which is a, a particularly rare Martini adjacent rifle with an additional lever on the side. Um, that wasn't used by the Natal Mounted Police at the time. 
so it's probably arrived on set as a plausible, correct rifle, but then it's in the hands of a, of a British uh, officer, I think it is, in that scene. So watch out for that. Then there are the, sort of te the techniques and tactics that aren't quite right, the classic uh, movie flinch. Um, I'd like to think that British soldiers would not have flinched despite the, the smoke and recoil of this thing. Um, the lack of recoil, of course. The, this, is all, this is unavoidable, in, a, in almost unavoidable in a movie context. And it sounds like I'm criticising the film. It's n not that at all. Um, we all love the film here at the Armouries. Um, the more you look, the more you'll see. So uh, this is a Mark IV Martini receiver with the hump. Look really closely and you'll see some Mark IV Martinis that they've pressed into service. Um, the, the brief story there is that this was an experimental cartridge that didn't, didn't pan out and they all got converted to the standard cartridge anyway. So you end up with a hump-backed martini. Those show up in, in Zulu, which they shouldn't in 1879. So I'm, I'm sure there are some you could throw in there. Um, the clothing and equipment isn't, isn't right either. Some of the events aren't quite right. The 24th Regiment of Foot was not really a Welsh regiment in 1879, but I'm outside my wheelhouse, so I'm gonna immediately um, stop there. And thank you very much for watching. Uh, this episode and do go and check out Real Time History's um, Anglo-Zulu War material um, and the other channels and books that I've mentioned here today uh, and thank you to Neil for, for his help. Thanks so much for watching everybody, we really do appreciate it. Uh, do remember if you're not already subscribed, hit the subscribe button and of course we always appreciate a like click as well, goes a long way um, and you can come and visit our real life museums if you'd like to do that. We also have, if you'd like to see these videos uh, without advertisements, you can go to, or download the app, or go to the website, History of Weapons and War, and a lot of the other uh, firearm and military history-based YouTube channels are also over there with something extra to offer you, whether that's um, no ads or even extra content in some cases as well. So please do go and check that out, see if it's something you'd like to, to sign up for. But you'll always be able to see um, the videos here for free, of course. See you again next time.